Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our conference on Central Asia in 2017. I'm Angela Stent. I'm the director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies here at Georgetown University. And I think we're going to have a very interesting and I'm sure quite intense discussion today um, with North Korea and Syria dominating the news cycle today. Um, Central Asia has obviously slipped from being front page news, uh, but I think that we're um, constantly reminded that it remains a key strategic region, uh, both for the region itself and also for the United States, for Russia, for China, and other neighbors. Uh, the recent succession in Uzbekistan has raised broader issues about domestic developments in the region um, and the trajectory there. And meanwhile, of course, the ongoing war in Afghanistan uh, reminds us of the challenges uh, that Afghanistan's neighbors, particularly the Central Asian states, continue to face. So we're very fortunate today. We have a terrific group of speakers, some of the best experts uh, in the world on Central Asia, uh, to discuss the situation in Central Asia. Um, both domestically and in the outside world. So I'm looking forward to a very interesting um, half day of discussions here. And I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Benjamin Loring, who's the Associate Director of Ceres, who's going to chair the first panel, and the other panelists up to the podium. <laughs> and I would very much like to thank the Chevron Corporation for their generous support of this conference. <clears throat> Good morning. So this is the first panel, which has been titled Politics, Economics, and Succession. And the idea is to uh, discuss the regional challenges uh, currently being faced in, um, by Central Asians and set up the keynote and the discussion of geopolitics uh, after lunch. Um, I've asked the panelists to discuss what we need to watch out for in the coming years uh, from their own vantage point, uh, professional or, or academic. Uh, I'm joined by four leading specialists on Central Asia, uh, starting uh, to my left, David Abramson of the US State Department, Marlene Laruel of George Washington University, David Montgomery of Communities Engaging uh, with Difference and Religion, and Amanda Wooden of Bucknell University. I've asked the panelists to keep their comments to 15 minutes, um, and then we'll open it up at the end for uh, a Q&A. So let's start with David Abramson. So th thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, um, and thanks for putting me first. Uh, um, so. First of all, I want to give the usual disclaimer that uh, U.S. government officials have to do, uh, which is that the views that I'm going to express today in this presentation are solely my own and do not represent or necessarily represent those of the U.S. Department of State or the U.S. government. So now that we have that out of the way, um, what I thought I would do um, because it's especially interesting is rather than do a tour of the region uh, country by country, um, which would end up in 15 minutes be rather a superficial coverage. I'm going to focus on Uzbekistan. Um, and thank you, Angela, for setting me up for that. Um, and, and so I want to talk about the succession, uh, what, we're, what we're seeing there, um, and uh, make some comments at the end about um, what to look for, for in the future and uh, regionally some of the uh, ripple effects or implications. Um, managed leadership successions in authoritarian regimes generally uh, are smooth. Um, and so um, this is no exception. Uh, two main reasons for that is that key resources are concentrated in a few hands. And those hands, uh, usually political economic elites, uh, have too much to lose by fighting over the succession. So they're going to come together and come up with a compromise candidate if they even need to compromise. Um, and so that's exactly what happened in Uzbekistan last September. Um, I, I'm also focusing on Uzbekistan not only because it's the country that I know the best, uh, but this has been 
uh, the succession has been the biggest event in Central Asia uh, since the 1990s, uh, when there was a civil war in Tajikistan. So um, this is something that is, many have anticipated uh, for a long time. And what I wanted to argue here is that there's been a fairly minor ripple effect across the region in terms of regional integration and cooperation. And this is a little bit provocative because there has been a lot of outreach on the part of the government, but I want to uh, uh, nuance that a bit in this presentation. Um, but there has the, the increases that we've seen of increased but limited cooperation, uh, some of which uh, predated Karimov's death. And I, I would argue that that has largely been in response to Putin's more aggressive foreign policy and in efforts to show that the countries of Central Asia, the governments can get along um, and that they don't need Russia to, as an arbiter uh, to solve their problems, whether they're border delimitations, whether they're security issues. And that tension uh, is continuing and we're going to see, see that continue despite a lot of uh, outreach and uh, positive rhetoric between the countries in the region and Russia. What does everyone want to know about Uzbekistan? A few questions. First, um, is President Mirziyoyev for real? Can we take his promises of change as legitimate? Is the hope his actions so far have inspired likely to endure? Um, and there is a lot of hope. Just from anecdotally talking with uh, Uzbeks who are here, who have gone back to Uzbekistan, uh, who have been there over the last few months, uh, there is a real sense of hope uh, on, on the part of the population about economic uh, changes and prospects for um, better prospects for the future, as well as uh, more political openness. Um, but what are Mirziyayev's likely objectives? And then what prospects for stably managing a transition between uh, Karim the Karimov era and uh, what we're uh, facing today? So with respect to leadership transition, as I mentioned, this transition was smoother than many, some expected, um, but was also, also the likeliest scenario for reasons that I already gave. Um, Mirziyayev needed, or whoever succeeded, in, his, in this case Mirziyayev, needed the support of elites, um, and especially uh, the support of the National Security Service headed by Rustam and Ayatov, uh, in order to assume the presidency. Um, there, there's, there's no question about that. However, um, tensions between the new president and the uh, old guard, uh, most uh, clearly uh, headed, uh, headed by, uh, by Inayatov and the National Security Service, are and were inevitable. Um, and so we're starting to see those tensions. Um, those tensions really started to emerge shortly after the election. <laughs> Um, after Mirziyayev uh, uh, was nominated as uh, the candidate for president's, uh, the presidency and then became pres elected in December of last year. So what's new? Mirziyayev's reforms and his leadership style uh, uh, distinguishes him from Karimov. Uh, and I just want to go through a few of those uh, as examples. Uh, one is a more populist approach. Uh, you can argue that Karimov uh, in his uh, last few years didn't have the energy to go out and meet people in the provinces the way he did earlier in, uh, in, in the regime. Um, but what that led to was a sense of um, that, that nothing was going to change, that he was out of touch and, 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 and disengaged. Mirziyayev has been very engaged in going out and talking to people and visiting, uh, making regular trips around the country. He also has set up sort of uh, complaint, uh, uh, online uh, complaint uh, opportunities for people, regular people to write in and, and talk about what concerns they have. This has been echoed uh, repeated across uh, several ministries as well, um, who are doing that within their uh, purview. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, corruption and cracking down on corruption, and that has happened, we've seen that before. 
Um, but some of the efforts to crack down on corruption have, it hasn't been all top down. So via the use of these uh, you know, uh, popular public complaint uh, options, it allows something to get into the press and, to, and at least it looks like it's coming from the bottom. Uh, whether it's actually being orchestrated to target somebody that Mirziyayev wants to get rid of because he wants to put in people more loyal to him is another question. But it's, it, it's, it's a top-down and bottom-up approach, whereas in, in the past it was just you get removed for corruption from the top. Um, another is um, uh, Mirziyayev's own movements and, and his locations. So he has established his, his work office in... Um, uh, not in the White House, but is operating uh, as an office out of Parliament. Um, and um, plus, he hasn't moved into the president's old house. He has remained in his own house and has, imposed, has, has not imposed a motorcade, a regular daily, twice daily motorcade uh, to and from a residence and his workplace. And, and people have noticed that. Um, so there's this sense that he's more a man of the people. Another uh, approach that he's taken is opening borders to trade as well as uh, resuming flights with Tajikistan after 20, more than 25 years of, where the, there were no flights between the two countries. There were a few snags along the way, but this actually uh, happened uh, just in the last month. Um, and th this is an important step between these two countries that uh, were increasingly barely uh, publicly on speaking terms, even if they had back-channel uh, negotiations with each other. Um, his restrictions have been lifted and harassment has been um, lessened on business activity in the country, which sends a message to small and medium enterprise ent enterprises that uh, this is, you have more opportunities. This is not going to be something that is controlled by the daughters of the president uh, or the national, solely by the National Security Service. And I'll get back to that connection in a minute. And then there have also been amnesties of uh, select prisoners of political prisoners, including uh, Karimov's nephew, after many years, who was in prison in Jazak, who was a human rights activist but also of uh, amnesties, official and unofficial, for uh, exiled businessmen um, or those who had just been removed from positions, had fallen out of favor, but were still in the country. Um, and there are, I think there are ulterior motives here, not just about opening up the business cl economic climate for business. Um, it does send a message to the international community that there may be uh, some changes uh, and, and that they're welcoming investment, and that's certainly uh, part of it. Uh, but there's an, a political side to this, too. Um, what hasn't happened, and, and not because Mirziyayev hasn't tried, um, is currency conversion. That has really been stopped in its tracks. Um, if it happens, there's always the chance that inflation, uh, shortages of currency, uh, hard, hard currency, um, uh, and, and social unrest could, hap could result from that. Um, what also hasn't happened are real measures to ease the investment climate. There have been some. Um, and a third is um, there was an attempt to ease the visa regime for traveling abroad or for people uh, from other countries, whether they would need visas to come. That actually was instituted and then withdrawn. Um, uh, allegedly uh, under pressure from the National Security Service. So that's, these are all points of tension with the National Security Service that uh, is the subject of this next uh, uh, question, what's behind it all? So asserting independence from the old guard is a necessity for this new president. Uh, by old guard, I mean the monopoly of the National Security Service, which really has had a monopoly over much of, of the country's uh, 
economic resources as well as security and much of the politics uh, since 2005, since Andi John. What happened in, then was that uh, prior to that, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the National Security Service had fairly equal power and they were played off against each other by Karimov. But the head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs after Andi John took the fall, took the blame for, for what happened there and Karimov gave uh, un, unprecedented power to Inayatov. So undermining the National Security Service, if you are to try to implement these economic reforms, um, is a real challenge. Um, so what some of the things that we're seeing uh, Mirziyayev do is to replace their presence in other government agencies other than the National Security Service. Um, sometimes that includes eliminating an agency and then creating a new one from scratch. Uh, we've also seen efforts to rebuild the Ministry of Internal Affairs, probably as a counterweight to the National Security Service. Um, and very imp just as importantly, it's undermining the National Security Service's network, uh, its network's economic monopoly. And you can do this, uh, especially hard access to hard currency, and you can do this by opening up borders for trade, because they were the ones who dominated that before. And they dominated even more once Gulnara Karimova and her sister, now that her, the, the fam that family is out of the picture. Trade across the board, licit and illicit with Afghanistan, uh, goods coming from China through Kyrg southern Kyrgyzstan to Uzbekistan and, and, and elsewhere. Um, he also needs to foster uh, new loyalists, appointing his own people to keep positions, but he can't just get rid of the old guard without some kind of backlash. Um, there's a lot of compromat floating out there, for example, that could be used to embarrass, if not him, then other people, uh, his loyalists beneath him. Cultivating ties with oligarchs uh, abroad and at home. Uh, Gafur Rahimov, based in Dubai, uh, is one example of that. This is somebody who um, can facilitate trans-Eurasian and beyond economic ties, uh, ties with Russia, uh, Alisher Usmanov in Moscow is another example, but I think Rahimov in particular is, a, is an important one. Um, these are people who can be brought back in to uh, help compete with and undermine the National Security Service's uh, monopoly over uh, the economy. Um, so there's a kind of chicken and egg dilemma here. Um, and I, that's not a, 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 a joking reference to uh, uh, Minister, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Deputy Minister, Prime Minister Azimov's uh, uh, humiliating assignment to go around and make sure that people at Khorezm and elsewhere had 100 chickens in their yards. Um, like you sort of imagine this guy with his nice shiny shoes going from uh, yard to yard, counting chickens and stepping in the chicken. Um, anyway, um, so what this is, is that Mirziyayev wants to, um, uh, wants to increase the, the country's hard currency. Um, but how long does he have to do this? Um, uh, how long is the honeymoon period um, so that um, he, or can the old guard actually resist long enough to undermine this broad hope, this broad sense, that popularity, that, that this guy is actually going to implement changes and force him to fall back on the sort of uh, Karimov-style tight political and economic control. Um, so um, I'm out of time. Um, we, if in questions and answers, or maybe uh, on the part of my colleagues, they can address some of the lessons for the region. I'm happy to address those uh, um, in the Q&A. So thank you. Up next, we have Marlene LaRuelle of George Washington University. Thank you. <clears throat> 
I will be discussing labor migration from Central Asia to Russia because that's really the kind of the main broad sociological trend for the region. And it also has geopolitical implication on the relationship between Russia and Central Asia. So I have a PowerPoint because I wanted to show you some statistical um, data. The first one, as you can see, and that's maybe obvious to many of you, but it's always good to remember that, is that half of the Central Asian population, especially in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, is less than 25 years old. So it's really very young uh, population. If you compare, of course, with Russia, you can see the dynamism going from Central Asia uh, uh, to Russia. <coughs> The, the real issue for Central Asia is that there is no way for these countries, all of them, each on their own way, to find enough jobs for giving work to this growing population. And you can see that it's a long-term trend. Until the 2040s, there will be growing population workforce in Central Asia, even if now the demographic transition is on its way, and so the population is slightly becoming older and older and not younger and younger. Still, all these new generations are arriving on the job market, and that will be like that for the next 30 years. So we are here looking really at kind of long-term um, perspective. And Russia remains the main labor market destination for Central Asia and for several uh, reasons that we can discuss later because they are also evolving. The general kind of framework of discussion is that since 2014 and the kind of slowdown of the Russian economy, the labor migration has been uh, uh, in decline from Central Asia. And I'm here giving you, so there are very different statistical data depending from which sources you are looking at. I took the kind of the most conservative, the lowest one given by uh, uh, Russian uh, federal agencies. And there are several interesting trends that you can see here. The first one is that the number of migrants from Uzbekistan almost collapsed by half. And that's really the highest, the country that suffered the most in terms of uh, 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 migration to Russia. We had different numbers that were showing more than 3 million uh, Uzbek migrants in Russia in 2014 and about 2 million now, so depending on the number. But still, it's, it's, it's a large collapse. While what is interesting is that for Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, the number didn't collapse so much. A little bit, but not so much. There are several reasons for that. For Kyrgyzstan, it seems that the fact that the country is part of the Eurasian Economic Union has been kind of protecting Kyrgyz migrants compared to Uzbek migrants in managing the, the, the slowdown of the Russian economy. For Tajikistan, which is not a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, it's probably that Tajik migrants were the first to work in Russia, and so the networks are so well established that, in a sense, they were able to find kind of way of coping with the, the slowdown. But it's really Uzbekistan which suffer uh, 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 the most. And that's interesting to then link that to what David was uh, discussing, is that, in fact, we have no real information about what these migrants are doing when they are back in, in, in Uzbekistan, are they back really in Uzbekistan or are they going somewhere else? We don't have really data. They seem to be back home, but then what are they doing? Which kind of job? What does that mean? I mean, it's still a large number of people and we don't really know how they will find their, their room on the job market in Uzbekistan. If we look at remittances, here also the numbers are quite impressive. If you compare 2013, that was the highest year with 2016. And here also you can see that Uzbekistan is the one which suffered the, the most of the collapse of remittances, really divided by, by two. While Tajikistan lost also a lot. But you can see, once again, Kyrgyzstan managed pretty well. And that's probably the belonging to the Eurasian Economic Union that helped managing the collapse of remittances. While for Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, it's really huge number. So here also, that's interesting to try to follow what is happening for migrant families at home and how they are coping with the, the, the collapse of remittances. If we look at the social strategies that we see emerging, so as I said, it seems to be a growing, we seem to be look, seeing a growing dissociation between your, your, uh, Eurasian Economic Union members and non-members. And of course, that's if you follow what is happening in Tajikistan and the regular discussion about entry, how to entry, in which condition to become a member, you can see how much for Tajikistan it would be important in terms of labor migrant to access uh, the Eurasian Economic Union. And in fact, there are growing discussion among 
labor migrant community, in the, I mean, Tajik labor migrant community, that they feel unhappy not being a member because the competition from Kyrgyz migrants is very visible. So if you are on the job market in Russia and you have a Kyrgyz passport, it would be easier to get a job because the Russian uh, uh, you, you, the, the Russian firm employing you don't have, doesn't have to do the same kind of paperwork. So you can become legalized more easily if you are a Tajik migrant on the market. You are less uh, uh, helped than if you are a Kyrgyz one. Clearly, migrants are staying longer, so they don't travel so much as before. They, once they are in Russia and they have something, they stay there and they send less money. So it's, in fact, strategies of staying and, and just making less money, but still staying as long as possible. There seems to be a growing trend in getting the Russian citizenship, either legally, either by just buying the, uh, a kind of fake Russian passport. That's an interesting trend because traditionally, before that, Central Asians who were really trying to get the Russian citizenship were in a strategies of trying to integrate. So there was long-term strategy to integrate in Russia. <coughs> now it seems many are just trying to get the citizenship just to have the flexibility of traveling back and forth. And so that doesn't mean that these migrants will really want to integrate in Russia. They can just be continuing going back and forth uh, between Russia and their home country, which of course has a kind of long-term geopolitical implication because we don't know exactly the number of people everywhere in the post-Soviet space who have a Russian passport and dual citizenships. And for the moment, Russia is not really using that, but you can see the geopolitical potential it has to suddenly, if one day Russia wants to kind of make public and play on that card the, about the number of people who have a Russian passport, it will probably be very high in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. We see emerging also better organized kind of trade union type movements among labor migrants. And that's interesting to see. It's often not happening in Moscow and St. Petersburg because these are two kind of difficult, huge cities. But in provincial cities in Russia, we see them being more and more organized, which is also interesting in discussing what does that mean in terms of political empowerment when they are back at home. And we know that there have been several attempts among Kyrgyz migrants less among uh, uh, Uzbek or Tajik migrants to try to be politically organized in order to influence what is happening at home. So it's possible that sometime for one of these countries, one day there will be a political change where the migrants will be really playing one role on another. We see emerging new social legitimacy at home. Many migrants who have succeeded in Russia are investing back in their country. They may be investing in different things. They may be investing in the infrastructure of their village. They may be investing in kind of religious legitimacy. That's becoming one of the main trends. But so we see emerging kind of alternative legitimacy by people who have made money in Russia and who are not linked to the political elites in their own country. So indirectly, they are creating a space for alternate legitimacy that are not linked to the elites in their own country. And then we have several studies that really showing that migration is the pathway to a kind of revival or renewal of religious practices. And many migrants consider that it's easier to pray and to, be, uh, 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 to practice Islam in Russia, because Russia gives you more religious freedom than many of the Central Asian countries. And so we see clearly that this new generation is kind of getting introduced to Islam and to certain type of Islam during the migration. And that will, of course, have an impact when they come back uh, uh, at home. And we already have some uh, elements showing us that. The big trend that we see among uh, uh, Migrant Islam in Russia are really interesting because they tell us a lot about Islam is evolving in Central Asia, even if it's territorially outside Central Asia, and how Russia Islam is evolving globally. We see really most communities emerging very clearly and in a sense becoming alternate to the home state. So if you are a migrant in difficulty, you will not try to go to your consulate or to even a kind of diaspora association. You will probably go to the mosque and ask for help. So we see mosque becoming really a place for collecting money for emergency situation, mutual help. We see them offering social and healthcare services. If you are a migrant in Russia and you have health issues, if one, someone from your community died in Russia, then the organization of the funeral, everything will be taken uh, in charge by, by the mosque. 
Uh, we see also that the mosques are becoming slightly politicized in the sense that if you are a migrant and you want to get news on how things are going on at home, but also how things are going on globally in the Islamic world, you stay at the mosque after the Friday prior and you will get someone telling who, giving you news about what is happening in Syria and the general atmosphere. And also, there are more and more kind of small groups that are based at the mosque that are giving information about Russian legislation, how to be sure you register as a migrant, if you got deported, arrested, how we can organize. So you see a real social life structuring around the mosque and not around any kind of secular diaspora association. And then it seems, and that's really research on its own, so it's several scholars seems to be coming to this kind of conclusion, but it's still an ongoing process. It seems that for migrants who are becoming more religious during their migration, and of course it's not all of them, there is a slight change of identity with feeling more Muslim and less ethnic, and there have been several studies discussing that, that aspect. And what is interesting is that the Russia's uh, the Russian spiritual board, bo both the, the historical one based in Ufa and the Council of Mufti based in Moscow, are both pushing for diminishing the ethnic identity of migrants when they go to mosque and pushing for the creation of a big kind of Muslim unity, which is very strange because it's going against the tradition in Russia to push for the ethnic identity and not the religious one. So the board themselves are really pushing for having, for example, all the priors, all the discussion done only in Russian and not in national languages, even if it seemed that after the big prior, uh, uh, in the general discussion on the, the sermon on Friday, then ethnic groups still meet and then discuss each of them their own issue, the ethnic, the Uzbeks, and the others. And what we see also emerging seems to be an interesting trend is that there seems to be a growing competition for kind of controlling the mosque. Traditionally in Russia, the competition went between the Tata and the Bashkir on one side and the North Caucasian who are usually having their own a, a, a small world and not trying to influence what was happening outside the North Caucasus. Now we see more and more uh, um, Tajik who are taking job as, is, as imam for mosque because there is not enough uh, uh, Russian citizens uh, uh, imam. And so we see a growing competition for this control of the mosque. And it seems there is a kind of dissociation between Uzbek migrants mostly going to Tatar mosque and Tajik migrants for reasons I cannot explain going to North Caucasian uh, uh, control mosque, which also means that we see emerging in Tajikistan some kind of Dagestani or Chechen influence on the way people represent Islam. They were just totally absent historically and which have no other connection than just these people meeting uh, uh, during their migration in Russia. So to conclude very uh, uh, rapidly, I think that's interesting to follow this kind of broad trend of migration in Russia and to connect it with what we see happening uh, uh, globally in, in, in uh, Central Asia. We see the rise of several uh, 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 different element. I put radicalization with a, a question mark because I think that's a very uh, marginalized trend, but we see the rise of illiberal value of ethno-nationalism, we see the change of the role of Islam in the public space, and all that is on one way or another also linked to migration, and we can discuss the the way the Russian narrative about conservative values is influencing what is happening in Central Asia, or it's a kind of homegrown grassroots movement arriving, happening in Central Asia. Uh, two and last uh, elements, I show you some surveys done 2014-2015 about the general public opinion, it's Kazakhstan case only, but that give you a kind of overview of the decline of so-called Western values uh, in the region, the rise of not the rise, but the high, still high level of Russia being seen as the model, sometimes the, 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 the small rise of China being seen as the model, that the first time China is higher, more popular than the US in Kazakhstan, 2015. And what is really important is the high number of people who say that they don't want to follow any of this kind of model. They want something that they would consider national, and therefore that kind of put us back into this general discussion of about the change of values. So I think what we see emerging is that, and to continue the, the discussion David began, is that we don't really see political changes in the sense of institutional changes in the region. But if we look with the kind of information we have about sociological trend, both among migrants and in the region, we see a plurality of worldviews and kind of ideological perception on the rise. 
and this mostly among young people. So we see youth polarization in terms of worldview and ideological values that will one day or another have an impact on the, the general evolution of the region and the way uh, uh, Russia or China will be influential there. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, up next, we have David Montgomery. OK. Um, so I'm sort of torn. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I could use Marlene's. So do I sit here? Do I go up there? And I went back and forth <laughs> trying to figure it out. Um, I'll go ahead and stay in deference to David, So um, because uh, Amanda will, of course, have a very uh, good PowerPoint with pretty pictures. Um, but I, as I was trying to think about what I would talk about, uh, in conversation with Ben before, it was really around trying to give a sense of the local understandings of opportunities and challenges as I make sense of them. And in, in many ways, it's fortuitous having followed Marlene because she explains everything better than what I will be doing. Um, and I don't mean that just as a compliment, though it's true. But part of what I want to get at is uh, in talking about sort of the relationship between religion and politics. Um, what Marlene was talking about in terms of the social factors around migration and people trying to make a living out of things explains things much better in terms of the struggles that people face at more of a local level than what we find in discussions around Islam or religion more broadly and its relationship with the state. So what I'd like to do is, is give a sense of uh, of sort of how some groups look at challenges and opportunities at different levels, how we tend to make sense of that, and perhaps where, where there's uh, some problems with that. Um, one of the, so, so overall, I guess one of the, one of the questions that I'm, I'm thinking about is, what's the role of religion in Central Asia? And part of the way, I guess, one would answer that question depends on your own views about religion. And, uh, you know, so if you think of, and I, I think that this can be discussed without any particular reference to a specific country, right? I can talk about this generally because the challenges are seen uh, structurally more so than uh, in specific details, that clearly there are different types of restrictions that each of the states pose on people who are trying to practice religion. But um, the issues are, are, are sort of more broadly, broadly shared. What I mean by that, right? So in broad terms, um, uh, you know, if you're talking about what does opportunity look like at sort of the nation state, we were at a, uh, a nice dinner last night, and all of the conversations were around uh, state actors or, or business opportunities, what gov how governments are negotiating trade deals with others, um, whether the one belt, one road policy is going to be helpful. Um, what are the types of opportunities that perhaps Turkey or Russia or China, um, Europe, or whatever, what they might present? Um, at another level, you have people trying to engage with questions about whether or not they can get, whether or not there's, um, you know, functional markets, uh, you know, whether there's um, factories that are working and such. And these are important types of conversations that we have. But we can have those conversations with only speaking about a couple people, right? So, so there's easy, it's, it's relatively easy to abstract what's happening in, in Central Asia without actually bringing into the way in which most people are experiencing what the challenges and opportunities are in Central Asia, right? So I spend most of my time in villages because villagers make more sense to me. Um, I grew up in a small farm town. That's just the way I see things. But so in terms of what... Um, what opportunity looks like for a villager, you know, it, it, it could be quite different, right? Because maybe the person can farm. There's an opportunity for that. Maybe, maybe there's an opportunity to sell goods in a market, but it may be you're selling the same types of goods next to someone else who's selling those goods. Um, so you might have a section where everyone is, you know, if you, if you go to a market where people are selling, selling soap, um, and they're all selling the same types of soap, and there's very little that distinguishes my kiosk from someone else's kiosk. Um, and, you know, it's tough. You can, okay, so we can frame this as an opportunity, but, but it's, it's not always easy. Um, there's not always a great deal of upward mobility um, or opportunity, unless you have networks that can help out. 
Um, you can be a laborer and go abroad, which um, I think Marlene really talked about well. But there's all kinds of challenges that are associated with that. You, you lose your connection to home. There's villages where there's no men. Now you have women going and, and all of that sort of ruptures the, the sort of traditional networks of being families, um, which should not be underestimated. Um, you can try and go to the city and get a job. Um, that's not always straightforward. It's not always filled with all sorts of opportunities. So, so I guess part of what I'm trying to get at is that all of these opportunities that one sees from the village level, it, they're, they're, they're fraught with struggles and there's difficult experiences around sort of regulations. Likewise, there's differences in terms of how we frame the idea of challenges. Um, at the national level or the state level, um, challenges are often seen, like I, like I sort of began, um, how can you um, create stability, political, um, you know, you have political obligations to others. There's economic needs to try to um, satisfy people who, to whom you are indebted uh, for your power position. And then there's, there's questions about security. Questions about security that often get framed uh, in terms around Islam. Um, and I want to sort of question some of that in terms of what that means. Um, but they often get, um, get framed uh, also in relationship to um, people who are perhaps just oppositional. And uh, is, Islam may be, be less of a factor in that. And, and in some ways, I, I want to engage with the idea of, of you know, discourses of danger and tropes of security and threats and such that um, have been prevalent in the region for a long time. And um, I, I, I sort of initiated the conversation by talking about what the role is of religion being influenced by our own perspectives about religion. And there's certain types of religious practice, radical, you know, Marlene put a question around radicalization of Islam. Um, but we've, we've, we buy the narratives of radicalization as if they're explanatory, um, perhaps too easily and, and too quickly. And I want to sort of push back against some of that. If we go through um, some of the instances a particular narrative can, can emerge that seems to label out certain problems. And, and we can just think of a, a few recent instances, whether it was the Istanbul airport bombing um, in 2016. Right? The first thing that came up was it was Islamic terrorists. Um, and in the media, it was, it was suggested that they were from Russia, Kyrgyzstan, or Uzbekistan. Um, you also had the uh, truck attack in Stockholm recently, uh, carried out by uh, Islamist from Uzbekistan, um, and a um, and the St. Petersburg metro attack also claimed to have been t carried out by an Islamist from Uzbekistan. Now, there's there's um, there's ways of using that type of language and rhetoric to um, crack down on groups that are in opposition, and we may we may feel that there's something about the Uzbeks that make them more likely to be to, to carry out terrorist acts. Um, and likewise, about people who associate with particular Islamic groups, more likely to carry out Islamic, Islamic attacks. This pushes the state to act in particular ways. But I don't think that those things themselves explain what's happening at a, social, at a sociological level um, the way Marlene's presentation did, right? So, I mean, what explains things more is why do you have men who have to go to Russia to work and not, they're not integrated well, right? And they're not necessarily seeing things as, as in, in sort of rigid Islamic terms when they go there. Uh, there's no integration and such. It's not necessarily that because they're Muslim, they are doing this, but it's other social factors that, that go into it. Yet the explanatory way in which many states engage with cracking down on terrorist in regards to security is there's something, um, there's something dangerous about Islam, in part because many of the people who are in, in positions, of, positions of power are mostly secularist in how they understand religion's role in the public sphere. Um, and then the, perhaps there's something ethnic about it, that, well, um, you know, Uzbeks or Tajiks or Kyrgyz or whatever are predisposed to being perhaps um, 
uh, more inclined to to religion, uh, religious extremism. And of course, that's not true. Um, and uh, you know, one way of thinking about it was uh, during the Bosnian War, for example, there was this idea that was put forth um, in, a, in a book called Balkan Ghosts, which was very influential in how the U.S. engaged around the, around, um, the conflict in Bosnia, that, that um, these groups had never gotten along together and that it was an ethnic thing that, pe- that the, that the um, Bosnians and the, and, the, and the Serbs and the Croats couldn't live together, even though the reality of the fact, for example, in Mostar, was people did live together. They intermarried and such. But yet using the, the categories of ethnic or religious allowed states to engage in activities that didn't actually enhance security or address the problems that were driving people to do things that are problematic. And I think that this is very much the same uh, situation in, in Central Asia today, that we're focusing on things that are, are more distant from what the causes are. Um, and that's why when I began, I said that, that looking at um, issues around immigration and migration are more explanatory. The way in which a lot of these things, I think, are experienced at a local level, I, I, I like giving a, a, a brief vignette of a story that, that took place, it was already, already 10 years ago now, but um, I was in the field and um, I had been mugged. I, I went um, to the police station to report it with a friend of mine uh, because I was, I was coming back from her, her mother's uh, birthday party and her father was a policeman at a different uh, location. And as I reported the, the event, I was asked to leave. The, um, the policeman uh, told her that if you sleep with me, I will help your friend. Um, now, she was mad, of course. I was late for a meeting with someone who was um, an Islamist. He ended up being a member of Tablika Jamaat. And I, I didn't at the time. I didn't know, but I didn't want him to. to know, I didn't want him to think that I was hiding something by going to the police station before visiting him. So I explained the situation, and um, his response was, "You know, look, if we were in charge, this wouldn't happen, right? Because this girl is someone's daughter, and and you know, this is just not right. I mean, and and so as I thought about if I were a father and had a daughter, this would be." A logical explanation for me. Right? It doesn't mean that I have to embrace any of his ideas around Islam, but that if the state that I experience is predatory, it's not supporting me, then the alternative makes a lot of sense. And eventually I start to move into um, you know, explaining why I'm practicing Islam or practicing some a particular type of religion more, um, more vociferously or more actively. Um, but the cause is not, be- it's not ideological. Often we don't begin with an ideology, but rather we begin with practice. And it's in relationship to the way in which we're experiencing the state that we find these challenges. Um, I want to sort of uh, uh, briefly, two minutes, okay. I'll sort of end with um, the way in which I think this plays out in... Uh, in much of an analysis, there was uh, recently there was a um, uh, international crisis group report on state fragility and radicalization and uh, in Central Asia. And I was myself and some others were a bit critical of it. And one of the things that for me was was uh, exemplary of the problems of the analysis. It was a particular sentence which I want to share. It was in the absence of political pluralism. A reliable state and economic opportunities, growing numbers of citizens are taking recourse in religion. Now, the problem for me is that I would have changed the last clause, right? Um, that, you know, in the absence of political pluralism, a reliable state and economic opportunities, lives at a local level are more challenging. The problem of saying growing numbers of citizens are taking recourse in religion is it it assumes that there's something wrong with religion as a way of engaging with moral life. And I don't think that's the way it's experienced locally. All of the all of the problems that we understand around radicalization, uh, they they can be they can be explained more effectively without speaking about Islam or religion itself. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And finally, we have Amanda Wooden of Bucknell University. Okay. 
Thank you uh, to Georgetown and Ceres for bringing us all together. A great panel. And of course, yes, I will have photos. David knows me well. Um, so uh, among environmental issues in, in Central Asia, uh, the most important ones for livelihood, culture, identity, and stability are about water in various forms and ways. The water distribution system is complex in the region, as, as many of you know, vulnerable, and at the heart of interstate disputes. So today I'm going to talk about some key issues currently and in the medium term uh, related to, in particular, water and related inter interacting uh, issues and think about the socioeconomic impacts and political dimension of these issues. In particular, I'm going to focus on uh, water and glaciers, water in the form of glaciers, food security, energy sector issues, public perceptions, and political ramifications. Well, it looks terrible there, but I think this map gives you a sense of uh, the, some of the key issues that I'm going to talk about and the interactions between uh, states in the region over water management. Uh, so. Some of the everyday hardships related to water and tension between governments in Central Asia uh, relate to hydroelectric dam development, uh, infrastructure failures, uh, and uh, water sharing along militarized border zones, as well as issues like flooding potential, drought, etc. We tend to think of water, especially when we talk in, in a political sense about it as conflictual, and ask, you know, when is the next water war coming? But everyday experiences uh, near border regions are important locations, not just of ongoing tension, but as required cooperation, which is more common uh, on an everyday basis. The most important water risks are political and economic. Government willingness to tackle everyday struggles with water and power provision. Subsequent contention between people and their governments about non-responsive policies, and then regional leaders' use of nationalist rhetoric to lay claim to waterways and rationalize particular waterway uses. Uh, more recently, just as an example of kind of some of the key issues happening now, uh, just this week, after an abnormally wet winter that was predictable, significant flooding in Kazakhstan, and evacuations because of it, and uh, one fatality, a, a young boy. This is a regular spring issue in, in high, uh, high precipitation winters, but it is magnified with warmer temperatures, greater snowmelt, uh, and possible uh, upstream riverbed construction, such as uh, dams, large dams. Flooding is also, uh, here's some, just some images from this week. Uh, flooding is also being predicted for uh, northern Afghanistan. And in several regions, uh, in the mountainous regions, gloughs, uh, glacial lake outburst floods, landslides, and mudslides are all hazards that come with this rapid e increase in water. There are some also in the red circled area, some uh, heat hazards identified, which also matter for health and agriculture to keep an eye on it in the near future. But these kinds of near-term issues portend some medium-term risk, increased risk with uh, climate change happening in, in the region. Before I talk about global climate change and water, I'm going to just highlight uh, what you hear about anytime you hear about water resources in, in Central Asia, and that is the Aral Sea issue. It's a well-known problem, um, which has slowly impacted the surrounding population and changed uh, mesoclimates, uh, that is, uh, area temperatures, and impacted agricultural production more, more regionally. As you can see here, this is an image comparing, uh, see the outline from the 1960 boundaries? And on the left, the photo is 2000, and on the right is 2014. And in 2016, we see uh, even greater decrease in the eastern side. So the eastern part of the Aral Sea is now no longer really functioning as a lake. There are these long-term slow processes of, of health impacts happening here, uh, but also things to keep in mind in terms of quality of life decreasing impacts on migration and contributing to animosity towards the government, in particular in, in Uzbekistan. Uh, and so thinking about secession and new policies in, in the new regime is something to consider interacting with this issue. 
Uh, the Aral Sea crisis has also figured into regional narratives about water energy nexus and criticism of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan's upstream hydroelectricity development plans by both Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And this issue I will return to of, of hydroenergy, but also, and importantly, both the Aral Sea and uh, issues of glacier decline uh, relate to our questions about dam construction. So this is a graph looking at the um, we can see here uh, the share of glaciated regions in, in runoff, the catchment basins, and how important these glaciers are, the different glacier regions, uh, for the total water supply. That is, the region of Central Asia is glacio dependent. It is not a precipitation dependent water regime. And so it really matters what's happening with glaciers in the region. The glaciers in both the Pamirs and Tian Shan have recorded on average steady declines in the 20th and early 21st centuries. In particular, smaller glaciers at lower elevation, those closest to and most important freshwater sources for populated areas, are primarily at risk and receding fast. So water planners in the region have long been concerned about the implications. Uh, the Projected decreases of Tian Shan Mountain glacier services over the next few decades means the region would shift from the current hydrological regime to a precipitation dependent one. This means greater variation in water levels between seasons and years. Um, we can see here that climate change in surface temperature and over the last half uh, a century, you can see there are different pockets of of greater impacts, but we see a change in temperatures. We, if we look at the climactic data for every country in the region, there's a clear determined trend of upward uh, temperatures. And here is where the most recent research tells us about what these declines in glaciers look like. This is recent area changes of selected glaciers in the Tian Shan. And you can see this happening uh, at different rates uh, for, different, um, if for different ranges. Um, you can see here, for example, Al Archa or an Isakul, um, Chewy Basin, these are what, what's happening to uh, the glaciers, is really leading to a change, as I said, in, in precipitate or in the, the uh, water regime. And most recent research that came out on the Tian Shan indicates that the region. First of all, the glaciers have declined by 50% in the last half century, and that the region will reach peak water um, as early as 2020, which is the earliest prediction, or somewhere between that period and 2040, and the range of estimates, um, depending on a number of things, such as any kinds of global greenhouse gas mitigation, any multiplier effects that we're not currently able to understand fully, like permafrost melt. So that is, uh, climate change impacts are already happening in Central Asia, and the permanent decline in, most, in the most important resources of the region may happen soon in, in the medium term, and at least in the la in next decade and a half. So people in Central Asia at the, at the governmental level starting to talk about this, this and you know, in terms of international agencies raising awareness and scientists organizing about this. Um, you can see here a series in 2014 and 2015 of seminars on the issue of, of glaciers in the region. But also this is something that is factoring into anxiety at the local level, at the community level, in particular in places where people uh, can see uh, glaciers. And they're talking about changes in ways they didn't talk about two, three years ago. Even as I was asking about those changes, people weren't talking about climate change, weren't talking about glaciers, and now they're worried. They've been talking about it in the last two years. You can see here, um, thinking about what those impacts might look like, like more specifically. This is a, a map for Tajikistan in areas where uh, glaciers uh, will disappear, for example, in red um, by 2050, and areas of glaciers decreasing by 20 to 50 percent in that time period, and, and then the larger glaciers, uh, higher glaciers later. So uh, one other example, this is Fedchenko Glacier, uh, and this is the, the decrease, decrease over the century. This is the longest glacier outside of the poles. As we think about the, the extent of glacier coverage in this region, really, this is a significant issue. So peak water uh, is important. Then we think about what are the impacts of these changes, um, not just glacier loss in terms of water supply for agriculture, 
but also thinking about temperature changes and vulnerability to uh, pests and different disease. And we see a number of, for example, wheat yellow rust epidemics. And so thinking about the political ramifications of shift in wheat um, productivity and food prices, we've seen in the past when Russia, Russian uh, wheat prices changed, it really impacted anxiety uh, in, in the local level and community level, the urban level in, in Central Asia. So that's another issue to pay attention to. So a couple of more uh, of the impacts, thinking about hydroenergy. Uh, hydroenergy projects, uh, long-term viability depends on water flow, in particular from, from glaciers. They're, they're planned to aid in storage, control floods, obviously produce electricity, the cash register dam idea. But there's concern about what water peak means it coming in the next couple decades for projects that take some time to build, like Rogun Dam, um, and what an investment in that kind of project might might mean when we have a shift in the actual supply. This is to be the largest, the tallest dam in the world, rather, not the largest. And it officially began construction in 2016. It will take some years. It's been very controversial. Compulsory donations extracted to the public um, were ended recently, so that's a change. But as the Rogun is constructed, it's estimated to displace uh, potentially more than 40,000 people. So it's something to watch as it's built, um, what that trigger, if it triggers anything, uh, at least locally on, in a political way. Um, more recently, Kyrgyzstan um, pulled out of some larger scale uh, uh, Kambarata project, the, the Kambarata project and Upper Cascade and the Naran River potentially seeking Chinese funding to continue this. But um, in addition to not having the funding, the Atambayev administration seemed to have also begun making a shift towards recognizing a more limited glacier future and is increasingly making statements regarding this and discussing ways to focus on small and in particular medium hydro potential. So this is an important opportunity for assistance and adaptation to climate change uh, future. Electricity production, especially in rural areas and especially for the urban poor, is an important part of stability and instability, as we saw in the 2010 revolution uh, and power shift in Kyrgyzstan. So renewable and off-grid technology transfer and development uh, is important to develop now, especially before the next drought, as we know that that's uh, a potential trigger. We can see uh, countries in the region talking about adaptation. Um, and in terms of energy efficiencies, grid changes, uh, and national strategies uh, regarding this. So um, last thing I want to talk about is, how much time do I have? Two minutes. Okay. Last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, another interacting factor for glaciers that is also a major political issue, and that is the Kumtor mine in Kyrgyzstan, where I've been doing quite a bit of research. And this is uh, you can see looking at the change from the development of the mine, and it is the only open pit mine in the world operating actively on glaciers, so extracting glacial ice to get at, uh, for, to get at the gold. And so uh, this issue in terms of the impacts on area glaciers, on four glaciers in the basin, and then impacts on the larger uh, range, is something that became a, a, a really contentious issue once images of the impact on the glaciers became public. And so we had this interaction between people becoming aware of what's happening to glaciers overall and what's happening to glaciers specifically in this place. What does it mean for whose gold this is, whose mountains, whose water future? Uh, and um, what it also means in the area is for some potential risks. So this is Lake Petrov. This is the change in. Uh, and the size, the growth of it as the glacier has melted, the lake has grown. And this is right next to uh, the mine. And it's just upstream from the tailings pond. And so the Kumtor Operating Company has indicated a high risk in the next 10 years for a GLOF, a glacial lake outburst flood, um, that could potentially significantly impact the tailings pond. So there are other concerns, a magnification of concerns here. And just a question about, you know, whether or not this is still a big issue, right? Uh, protests have quieted down in the recent years, but that was mostly because of arrest and um, a real significant pressure on places where, and communities where protesters were organizing in the uh, Jetiaguz region of Issaquah, in particular in the village of Saru, um, where 20 people were arrested and a series of people have been jailed. And then we just saw in the last weeks, um, uh, Sadir Japarov, who is at Atajert, uh, Opposition politician returned to Kyrgyzstan, was arrested, and then we saw protests in response to that. And so some 
concern about the ways in which the Kumtor issue might factor in upcoming elections is something to keep in mind. Um, one thing to point out is that when the protests happened in 2013 was also the same time the parliament passed a law on glaciers that would have uh, outlawed open pit mining uh, in glaciated areas. It wasn't signed into law, but there was certainly a larger conversation about what kind of mining would happen there. In terms of foreign policy issues for the future and implications from this, I can talk about that in the Q&A if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, now we've got, uh, a, I think, about um, half an hour, maybe a little bit less, uh, for questions. Uh, who would like to? We've got microphones, um, two microphones at the back that will be uh, available. Uh, who would like to ask the first question? Yes, sir. Oh, you don't? Well, okay. We'd like My name is uh, Richard Fien. I worked at State Department and other federal agencies, but most importantly, I covered the Middle East for the Voice of America and a number of newspapers. The question I have is regarding uh, who is paying for the mosques and the imams. I know that Turkey is very involved in that area. Uh, I know the Iranians have tried, and I talked to some Saudis not long ago, and they're going to quote unquote up their game in that region. So, could you please, you know, discuss that on what you hear and where you see the trends? Thank you. Um, I, I think we'll go one by one for now, and then maybe later we'll change it. So, a lot of people are. I think. Um, I think you have. Uh, you, I mean, you have some Turks paying for it. You have some Saudis paying it for it. You have um, people who are businessmen paying for it locally, um, and getting that information is uh, difficult. But but there are people working on that. Yeah, I think. The f foreign money is not, <clears throat> is not so important. The majority of new mosques built, <clears throat> especially in rural regions in Central Asia, are built by Central Asians, either collecting money at the group or having a rich donor from Central Asia. So it's not so much foreign money, even if sometimes you still have it, but it has been largely controlled, and, and the communities are now working in g getting their mosque by themselves, and, and you have, as I said, a lot of migrants who have succeeded in creating their businesses in central in Russia or somewhere else, who are sending back money under the to to get a, a mosque or a madrasa. So so I don't if there is foreign influence in Central Asia in terms of religious things, it's more mostly kind of proselytizing, teaching things. It's not through the mosque construction. The mosques are mostly locally and controlled. And I, I, I agree with what Marlene just said, and also that it, it also varies a little bit from country to country, yeah. and that in Uzbekistan, um, foreign money for mosque building is just not an option, um, and Turkmenistan as well, I mean, except through very tightly controlled state structures. Okay, next question, and I should ask that uh, the questioners introduce themselves. Yes, Andy. Uh, thanks. Excellent panel. Really interesting presentations. Andy Cutchins, Georgetown University. My question is, the first part of it is to David, and then perhaps others may want to comment on the second part. Um, in describing the uh, Mirza Yayef um, succession, uh, and this accords with what I've read, what, what you were saying, that is Mr. Inatayev and the security services that played the kind of the key kingmaker role in facilitating it uh, rather smoothly. What was interesting in your presentation is it sounds that uh, Mirza Yayef is, he's only been in power for six or seven months. It sounds like he's quite assertive uh, in, in, in some areas contesting the interests of those kingmakers that brought him, brought him to power. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about that tension. I kind of brought to mind to me the, uh, you know, the CPSU nominating Mikhail Gorbachev back in 1985 and, um, uh, and then embarking on a program that's uh, basically undermined the interests of those that brought, brought, brought him to power. But the other question has to do with, uh, with Kazakhstan and uh, the possibility of succession there. And certainly what happened in Uzbekistan seemed to be kind of a wake-up call for um, Uzbekistan's northern, northern neighbors. And there was a number of uh, uh, legislative changes in the fall and some interesting personnel changes as well, um, the most notably moving uh, the now former Prime Minister, Mr. Masimov, 
uh, over to head the security agencies and uh, the, the former deputy premier, a very, very popular politician, is sent off to Moscow as the ambassador. Um, for those that want to comment, uh, uh, what is your perspective on uh, how smoothly a Kazakh succession uh, would, would go? I guess my hypothesis is that it would be a bit more complicated because there are more independent power centers, kind of politically and economically, but I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then share at, at least the second question with my, my colleagues. Um, uh, so I think there was always an understanding that there was a transactional uh, approach to what was going to happen in the succession. Um, but the main thing was getting somebody in place without a public struggle or without any struggle about who's, who that's going to be. Uh, yes, Mirziyayev has only been there for six months and has attempted to do a lot, but this is after years of a kind of uh, lethargy in the economy and the political system. So it was very important to um, instill a sense of hope, but also um, greater certainty, confidence in the population, and more, even more importantly, among the elites about who's going to be in charge. There was a lot of concern about that, even prior to Karimov's death, but around that time, people did not know what was going to happen. There's also the additional um, need to stave off concerns about external powers interfering. Um, and of course, that, that's, there's going to be some of that, but I think it was very minimal, and they minimal, minimized it even more by announcing Mirziyayev as the uh, you know, president interim leader very quickly um, and, and then having that election um, and, and, and getting that out of the way as quickly as possible. And Mirziyayev had been uh, already prime minister for 13 years, so he wasn't exactly a, a newbie um, and, and, and really understood not only how uh, observing how Karimov worked, but also observed how, who had channels of information and how information was withheld or passed on to Karimov over many years. So that's important too. Um, I'll let others talk about Kazakhstan or, or Uzbekistan. Well, uh, yes, some comments on, on the Kazakh case. I agree that it looks from what we see from our own perspective that it could be probably more difficult because as you said, there is a plurality of economic and political actor that is la more diverse than what we have in Uzbekistan. Another big issue that Kazakhstan will have to face is that the presidential family and the, the daughters and the son-in-laws are still in action politically and econ economically. Uzbekistan was lucky to have Gulnara put outside of the game while the father was still there. So in a sense, the succession is now managed also well because the, the daughters are out of the game and the Karimov family is already out. That will not be the case in Kazakhstan. And you have two daughters, I mean three, or, but two very active both politically and economically. And, and that will probably create tension about the future of the Nazarbayev family once he is himself no more there and the relationship with both the oligarchs and the technocrats. At the same time, I think if you uh, uh, follow a little bit the, the kind of what we can see from the the, the internal discussion, they learned also from, from Ukraine so much. And this notion, and I don't know if they will still have it, but in 2014, it was so clearly felt that, OK, we know that if we mess up at home and that suddenly we kind of open a space where politically we are creating some contestation coming from the street or some tensions, we are also putting ourselves in a risk risky geopolitical situation. So what is happening internally among elites can suddenly have a, an impact on the national sovereignty. So I think that this feeling is still there. And so maybe that will help also kind of trying to manage things in a, in a, in a smoother way. It's a good one, yeah. And you have a long tradition of political assassination in Kazakhstan in the 2000s, which is also a way to eliminate in a nicer way than, in a more dangerous way for political stability than have its street actions, so. <laughs> okay, I think now we're gonna, just because we don't have uh, that much time, I'm uh, gonna take two questions at once. Uh, yes, ma'am. Microphone. 
Hi, Amy Conroy, Chevron. Great panel, really fascinating. Um, I have more questions on the migration uh, presentation that you presented. So are people generally uh, younger men migrating to from Central Asia to Russia? And is there any, you talked about Russian citizenship, is there any goals of bringing family along or is it really just men coming, men going back? Or what kind of, what are the additional trends and is it all seasonal or how, could you delve into that a little bit more? Yeah, of course. So, so it's mostly. Can we, can we collect um, another sorry, question? sorry. Yeah, of course. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Manzura Monica, Bundeswehr University, of Munich. Thank you very much for your presentations. My question has to do with security, in particular with foreign fighters uh, from Central Asia who went to join ISIS and Jabhat al Nusra in Syria. Um, from the research that I've done, I've noticed that. Um, that majority of the foreign fighters from Central Asia were ethnic Uzbeks. And I was wondering, how do you explain, explain this trend, whether it's a combination of, you know, Uzbekistan is the most populous uh, in the region, it has the most uh, migrant laborers in Russia, which also uh, one of the uh, ways to, for recruitment uh, into radicalization, or whether it's, um, you know, Uzbek exiles, uh, religious exiles in Saudi Arabia in, in the region. <coughs> or the connection with IMU or an IGU. And the second question is, uh, how real do you think the blowback is, uh, you know, from these returning foreign fighters? Because in the region, in Central Asia, uh, some say it's an exaggerated threat, some say it's actually real, but to what extent do you think it actually has the potential to destabilize the region as some of the actors in the region claim? Thank you. Okay, so on, on the migration question, so yeah, it's mostly uh, young men. There are an interesting trend coming from Kyrgyzstan, which is it's largely feminized now. F women are representing about 40% of migration uh, um, to Russia. It can be women by themselves, but it's very often family migration. So, and it's a Kyrgyz specificity. All the families migrating, men will be working in the construction site, women would be becoming nanny, waitress, whatever they, they, they can do working on the, on the market. For Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, which are more traditional family, it's mostly men living, often living, so either very young before the wedding because you need to make money to then be able to afford a wedding or living as soon as the wedding has passed and then that creates a lot of social, social tension because the new wife is staying home with the in-laws and, um, and so on. And then, yeah, there is clearly a strategy for those who want to stay and try to integrate then usually after a certain time, the family will be coming. But you also have men who are staying for years doing seasonal uh, uh, back and forth, like five months in Russia and uh, uh, the, the rest of the year in, in, the, in the country of origin, and then creating dual families, one in Russia, one in the region. So that has a huge social impact on the communities. I mean, all the, the wedding tradition, the social networks, everything has been transformed in rural Central Asia since the last decade because of men migrating, with huge impact about definition of what is the role of a woman, what is the role of a man. It's, it's really, it's huge on, at the it's social level, it's huge impact. In, in, in terms of the, uh, the question about uh, foreign fighters joining ISIS and stuff and being uh, mostly ethnic Uzbeks, I think the thing that I would encourage us to not think is the Uzbeks as being the explanatory part of the, the, the framing, right? I, the first thing I was thinking of was that, um, you know, Durkheim's early studies on suicide uh, was, I mean, okay, there's all kinds of flaws with the study, but, um, you know, part of what he was getting at was that one of the things that explains higher suicide rates in Paris in the 19th century was um, that there wasn't incorporation, right? There was alienation. And this is what a lot of people experience when they go abroad. Um, and I think that that explains things, and those are the types of things that we should begin looking at, right? Those types of social factors where people are treated pretty poorly, um, they are, um, they're not integrated in any meaningful way, and um, they are looking for, for something. Ultimately, we do look for meaning in life. Um, and, um, and so I think that those are the types of things that, that sort of explain it more than anything else. So, in terms of it being Uzbek. It probably has a lot to do with the social environment and social conditions out of which they're coming. Um, but that itself is, you know, it's more of a political context than, you know, something tied to ethnicity itself. Um, 
And in terms of the blowback, um, I think it's been largely exaggerated for, for opportunistic purposes. Um, a lot of people, m many get killed. Um, the vast majority do. They, you know, whether, that doesn't mean that some won't begin coming back in greater numbers. Um, but to say that the explanation is, is because they were Islamists and this is what Islamists do, I think misses the opportunity for addressing what, what are the social issues behind it. And I'd just like to respond to your uh, question about the foreign fighters. I can think of about five possible explanations. Uh, or uh, One is that um, Uzbeks don't, in Russia, do not have the same long-established networks that Tajiks have who have been going there since the war in the 90s. Um, they also don't have the same privileges that the Kyrgyz have, have had for linguistic Russian knowledge, knowledge of the Russian language, but also more recently from Kyrgyzstan having joined the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, and as Marlene's uh, slide shows, the Uzbeks have suffered the most from uh, restrictions and uh, the economic downturn in Russia uh, on migrants. Um, another one is that, um, so yeah, and that's they've suffered more from uh, migration. Um, also, um, they are more populous. Um, and, and then some of the ones that we've seen are also from southern Kyrgyzstan. Um, so they're not from Uzbekistan. So that's a different demographic. And um, there have been a lot of issues uh, with the relation, the p politics of, in southern Kyrgyzstan over the years, too. Can yes, I just add yeah, one more point on this blowback to kind of uh, reinforce what uh, De David said, that it's largely ex exaggerated. The majority of Central Asian fighters are just dying in Syria, so they will not go back. The average spine life of a fighter is about six months, and there have been several studies like by people like Noah Tucker and so on, following you know, Uzbek social media of foreign fighters, showing that they are usually put on the front of the fight. So they have a high level of deaths more than other foreign fighters. Then those who would really stay alive and really be convinced jihadists, they would just follow on another war theater as soon as it will be moving. They will be going to Libya or whatever will be the next place. And then certain number of them will try not to go back to Central Asia, because the number of those trying to go back is very low, low, low. They will go to Turkey, and there is now a huge number of women and children of dead fighters blocked in Turkey with no possibility to go back to Central Asia. And this one can be recruited by new, <laughs> new people. And or they will try to go to Russia, or they will try to, to ask for political asylum, or whatever they can do. So Central Asia is not at risk on that. It, it's the other countries. That, that would be so. So just to kind of yeah reinforce, and I think just if I may one, one sentence, it's linked to these Turkey things. I think we really we didn't really realize because we don't have the tool to follow that for the moment the impact of what is happening in Turkey since last year and what it means for Central Asia. It's just huge when we follow Central Asian social media. It's just that it hasn't been studied, but it's really changing the picture on many aspects for Central Asia. Okay. Would like to ask more questions. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back, and one more, yes. Curtis. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Zuhra Halimwa. I'm from George Washington University. Thank you for wonderful presentations. They were very insightful and actually very timely as well. Um, it just came from Tajikistan, and actually it was a huge uh, publicity about new. Uh, contract between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan on selling the Korean uh, cars. Oh, ca American, yeah, well, American <laughs> cars in Tajikistan. So it's somehow benefiting Uzbekistan to make sure that their product is moving over uh, Tajikistan. However, my question is a little bit about something else. You mentioned about the loyalty and new loyalists to Mirziaev. But it's true about the rest of the presidents. They are creating this new generations of loyalists. And in every country, they have their own way of doing it. Like in Russia, they have their own way in, in Tajikistan, even though it has that smell of naphtaline 
like you know something like a Soviet type of thing. But in reality, the way they recruit those people, it's a little bit different. Um, and then there is a question about the old loyalists, and we are talking about this, the ones whom you mentioned about the security forces. And the question is either they have a double citizenship, even it's illegal, in Tajikistan it's legal to have it if it's Russia. In the rest of the countries is illegal, but still most of them have. But it's also something else which never mentioned in any conferences, that most of the law enforcement and the ones who actually served in the Soviet army has the possibility to receive pension in Russia. So most of these people actually own pension in Russia. As soon as they reach the age, they go and actually create this whole system, and they receive pension from Russia even though they are actually officially recruited in the official you know, uh, institutions of uh, the Central Asian countries. So it's a question about how this loyalism is built. Is it about increasing their benefits in country, or is it about actually detaching them from the benefits they receive from Russia? Um, and the other question I actually want to ask uh, Marlene, you mentioned about migration mainly. You didn't mention anything about immigration, uh, actually, which is actually very clear. While migration is more about youth, and immigration is about adults, the ones who are having education as of 1991. And they have actually clearly specializations. So there is two trends going on. Both of them are brain drain, the one is, which is young brain who is living, and then uh, the one who is old brain is also leaving the countries of, of former Soviet Union into Russia or not only. And there was one uh, uh, mentioning uh, by one EU official that uh, Tajiks now seeking for asylum and they are now the third after Syrians and Turks to EU. So uh, I think this is a new dimension which was no, never happening. What is um, your explanation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. One for David, oh, which uh, is very I, I'm short. Sorry. We're, it's we're about have secularism in the officials. Uh, you said about officials are secular, but it's not really the secularism as you understand in Europe and United States. It's a very different secularism. Can you explain that? OK. And Curtis? Hi, Curtis Murphy. I teach East European history here at Georgetown. Very quick question for Amanda, and that is, can you talk about the perspective for the RLC going forward? I read something recently that there was some effort on the part of, of Kazakhstan to uh, attempt to rebuild it, and I want to know uh, what you think will happen with that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, can we start with that question first for, for Amanda? Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, Chris, for that question. Um, so the efforts to rebuild the Kokaral, which is the smallest part of the Aral Sea in the north, it's been over the last decade um, construction of a dam, which basically keeps uh, the water flow on to the northern part just contained in that in that part of the lake, right? And so that there's been a lot of discussion about the revival of the Aral Sea through this project, and it certainly has changed uh, in a local way and in the Kazakhstani part of the Aral Sea of uh, fish production, for example. And there's some really interesting anthropological studies coming out of Tubingen University about what that means for communities in the area. Um, there's a new dis dissertation, I think, also coming out. Uh, someone else just wrote a new dissertation about that, kind of what it really means culturally and for jobs and employment. But the drawback of the concentration of the revival of the Aral Sea in the northern part is that it speeds up the desiccation in the larger part of the ecosystem. And so you saw that rapid change. I mean, there's actually more rapid decrease in the eastern uh, part of the Aral Sea, the largest part. And so it, it sped that up. And so what does it mean for the whole climate and for Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan is probably worse than it was before. Um, so it's locally better, regionally worse. Um, you want yeah, okay, uh, just real quick in terms of the, 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 the issue of secularis secularism, what I meant by that. Yeah, there's all kinds of secularism, and I wasn't really trying to get into that, that discussion. But um, what I meant is that for many of the people who are uh, leaders in Central Asian countries, but also in many countries, religion is not a lived category for them, right? They, they, they envision um, religion as, as being something that is privatized, right? You can be religious, but keep it private. 
separating outside of the public sphere. It becomes problematic when, um, when it becomes too active in, in public. And, and you see a lot of that um, in the early attempts to try and have Islam as part of the Central Asian identities. Um, there was a certain, certain idea of what that meant. But it meant, yes, we're Muslim, but you know, keep the Muslim at home and don't, don't make it too, you know, leave it out of the politics and stuff. But just a quick response. But that's what I was, was getting at. Mm, on the immigration point, I think, Zuha, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a growing trend. I think it's both a regional one. I mean, brain drain has been revived also from Russia since 2011-12. So I think you have a general new trend of many people, from highly educated young people from the former Soviet space globally trying to leave. Um, and from Tajikistan, it is particularly visible because I think the, the political situation also deteriorates uh, uh, clearly this last year. And there have been the feeling in the, in the country by many people that, well, it was really time to emigrate for those who could really make it. So I think there is both a regional trend of revival of, of uh, highly educated immigration and a local explanation for the specific case of Tajikistan. And, and just to uh, briefly address the loyalty question and the security services, um, I, I think it's a really a mixed bag in terms of those who have the option of getting their pensions and retiring in, uh, in Russia um, versus you know, where their loyalties lie. Um, but it's also a generational thing. And in Uzbekistan, I think one of the... the ways of replacing and ensuring loyalty just to be on the safe side. And only those who are 45 years and older are going to benefit from those because um, directly, because they are the ones who had any chance of serving even at the age of 20 uh, in, 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 the, in the Soviet period. Um, but also targeting younger generations in terms of bringing them up into positions. It's not only for this loyalty uh, re, uh, security uh, issue, but also in terms of ec economically, there are a lot of people with expectations, business interests, and, and trying to get them in. So to just to uh, extend the, 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 the barnyard metaphors from, you know, I was talking about chicken and the egg. I mean, it's also a game of chicken in terms of getting people, you know, how, how, how soon can you get younger generation people into these positions of authority? How quickly can you do that in a, in a society where there's, that's still um, the top positions are dominated by people over 45? Okay. Um, I'm afraid that we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we have lunch coming up. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>